When The Dark Knight was released in the US on July 18, 2008, it was immediately clear that not only had director Christopher Nolan elevated the superhero movie genre to something approaching high art, but that an iconic take on a classic character had also emerged from the endeavor. Heath Ledger's dark, scary, and more realistic take on Batman's age-old nemesis, the Joker. On the occasion of The Dark Knight's 10th anniversary, we spoke with the makeup artist John Caglione Jr., who was nominated for an Academy Award for his work on The Dark Knight, along with Connor O'Sullivan. Caglione had previously won an Oscar for his makeup on Dick Tracy back in 1991, so he came into The Dark Knight with some very relevant experience in the realm of creating grotesqueries. But when it came to birthing a new version of the Joker, the makeup artist quickly realized that he would be crossing into some new and uncomfortable terrain. So I, I read this, the script for The Dark Knight, and having seen the first one of Chris Nolan's trilogy, you know, I got the feeling that it was going to be more of a kind of an organic-looking thing. You know, it was going to be kind of a real, not not so comic booky, uh, going in and then you know talking to Chris and meeting him, then it, it became. The, you know, of a more more realistic approach to the makeup. You know, what would it be if this guy slept in his makeup? You know, this you know this the psychopath. If he didn't, uh, you know, spruce up his makeup for two or three weeks, and you know, he never changes his clothes. You know, it was th those kinds of organic details that really helped. When Caglione joined the production, Ledger was already signed on to play the iconic villain. The makeup designer's earliest meetings were with the actor, director, and costume designer, Lindy Hemming, followed by Caglione creating five or six color sketches as overlays of headshots of Ledger, complete with green hair, different kinds of clown makeup, scars, and so on. This was followed with some makeup tests with Ledger in London, but as the process continued, it became clear that Caglione had to abandon his artist's instinct to get everything just right. You know, you go into it and, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're trying, as a makeup artist, you know, I'm always trained to you know every little detail you know and you think of a clown makeup and for the most part they're pretty detailed and with sharp lines but this had to be the opposite of that you know it had to look very broken down very uh, very lived in so yeah my first few attempts were too perfect so i had to kind of let my hand go and it, it was hard you know <laughs> it was really hard to do that and i remember like the first week the first few days on set i would look at the makeup and you know, you don't know the context of the film and the overall vision, and you're looking at it as a makeup artist, and I'm seeing this is the worst makeup in the world here, you know? <laughs> you know, it was, I was like, oh, am I doing the right thing? You're looking at all the great makeups in history, not just the Joker, but, you, you know, Clarabelle and so many other great, you know, Emmett Kelly, and, and they're always doing very accurate, very precise makeups, and then here comes this, you know, ah! But thank God it all worked out, right? <laughs> It's easy to forget now, but before The Dark Knight was released, the standard bearer of Joker makeups was the Jack Nicholson version from Tim Burton's 1989 Batman. But Caglione says that as far as he can recall, that design was never really discussed when creating the Ledger Joker. In fact, even the idea of the Joker's white face being the result of an accident, which is clearly the case in the Tim Burton film, just didn't fit in the Nolan world of Batman. The first Batman was amazing. You know, I love Nicholson's makeup. And I love uh, the whole approach to Tim Burton, you know, the comic book style of the film. It was just, it worked, it was, everything about that film was great. So, you know, in the back of my mind, maybe, subconsciously it was there, but no, it never came up in meetings or discussions. It was like, let's roll up our sleeves and make this thing look, you know, like, like a real person could have done this to themselves. Part of the doing this to themselves aspect of the character includes the question of those scars on either side of this Joker's face. Of course, the film itself leaves the question of where the scars came from open to interpretation, as unknowable as the Joker's ever-changing origin. I always got the impression that it was self-inflicted, but it's up to you to decide, you know, did it, did, did, was he punished, was it, was it abuse, was it a, an abusive situation? Uh, it could have been that, that just tipped him over the edge and, you know, mutilate, self-mutilation. We, we never really know for sure. Not surprisingly, Ledger himself was very involved in creating the makeup with Nolan and Caglione. Indeed, he was essential to getting the worn and cracked look of his Joker just right. He was great with Heath. It was just a great experience. He was a great person to work with every day. And it was like a dance because, you know, certain parts of the makeup to get those cracks and all the drippy stuff, you really need the cooperation of the actors' facial gestures when laying down the makeup and the paint. So 
we had a lot of fun together on that movie. He would contort his face or raise his eyebrows, or I would even take, you know, one hand and kind of scrunch the corners of his eyes to create crow's feet. You know, I'd do all those wrinkles and then brush grays and white colors over it, and then he would relax, and you get all these kind of expressive lines and details that just come naturally. It's an old, it's listen, it's an old theater trick. They were doing it in the, like the uh, turn of the century, the 1920s on, in, in theater. Actors would put like white makeup on and scrunch their face and let it go and then paint little brown lines. So it's nothing that we really invented. So it was a throwback to, you know, old makeup techniques. Another throwback in the design process came in the famous interrogation scene, where things get real rough between the caped crusader and the clown prince of crime. You know, Heath and I would always be like, gee, what can we do a little different? you know, toward the end of the sequence. And I remember one time we were talking about the scene where um, he gets beat up by Batman. At the end of that scene, he wanted to, you know, have a different look, Heath. And, uh, and I think we were thinking about, you know, what could we do with the eyes, the blacks and, the, and stuff. And I said, well, you know, there was this great villain in the Chaplin films. Um, the actor was Eric Campbell. And he always played the big heavy in all the Chaplin movies. And he had these big black eyes that kind of like had these black eyebrows. And Heath was like, let me see a picture. So I pulled it up and we kind of went for that kind of look. It was a throwback to an old Chaplin villain. According to Caglione, Christopher Nolan wasn't the kind of director who said, I want you to do exactly this. Instead, he would offer inspiration and guidance. Take, for example, the paintings of Francis Bacon that he brought to Ledger and Caglione early in the design process. I think it was his way of saying, let's blur this, let's just lo let's loosen this up, you know? Here's a book, look at it, and maybe you'll find some inspiration. And it really helped, it was, a, it, you know, we turned a corner. You know, he didn't have to say much, but that was the, the way it kind of went. And then he helped me to relax, and, you know, the great actors help you relax, so you can really bring it, and you, and you, you can just try, to try different things and feel free to do it. But that Francis Bacon painting, that day that Chris came in, plopped that down and we went through some pages and he said, yeah, maybe, look, you know, look at this picture, look at that picture. I think he actually had some of the pictures tagged with post-its that he liked, just for inspiration. Funny enough, it was a Francis Bacon painting in the 1989 Batman that the Jack Nicholson Joker spared during his gang's rampage in the Gotham City Museum. Coincidence? Who can say? Of course, sadly, Heath Ledger passed away before The Dark Knight was released. He went on to receive a posthumous Oscar for the role, but had he not died, the actor could have returned as the Joker. Caglione recalls Ledger talking about his ideas for the character beyond The Dark Knight. He actually did talk to me about it. Um, he wanted to go to, you know, start at the Arkham Asylum. You know, his idea, I don't know if he ever talked to Chris or anyone else, this was just private moments in the chair with Heath, you know? And conversations like, wouldn't it be great to go back and see what really happened to this guy, how he became what he became, and and why he just is, you know, flipped flipped out and it became maniacal, and um, and you know he always thought it would be great to go back to the asylum, and or even before that. But I'm sure as an actor he needs to know the origins of this character. I mean that's really important to him. He was excited about the idea of go, going back in time and seeing how he became the Joker. You know, the, the, the evolution of the character would have been cool, would have been cool. Indeed, it would have been cool, but at least we'll always have Heath Ledger's amazing performance from The Dark Knight and the unforgettable look of the character created by Christopher Nolan, John Cagnione Jr., Connor O'Sullivan, Lindy Hemming, and of course, Ledger himself.